Hey, welcome back to another episode of Genuine Questions. Uh, I lied again. This is not going to be the part three I was talking about in the last video. I figured I would do something a tad different. Talk about a conversation I had with an actual person in a local Facebook group. I am wildly unpopular in this Facebook group. It's mostly comprised, or at least the vocal ones are a lot of liberals and often will, you know, tell me how much nobody likes me and I should just go away. But I honestly have too much fun talking to them and hearing what the liberal mindset is and what the other side of the arguments are. And one of the insults that you frequently hear if you don't fall in line with this Democratic Party orthodoxy is that you are just a part of Trump's cult and you're brainwashed and blah, blah, blah. And I just, it cracks me up when they say that because it's like they're accusing you of what they are doing. Like, they are in a cult. They are the ones that have these mic drop phrases that they think just end a conversation and they don't ever talk to anybody who disagrees with them. So many of those mic drop yes. phrases that yes. they use, you know, kids in cages. Yes. Which, of course, we don't want kids in cages, but right. there's a whole discussion to be had about immigration yes. as opposed to just kids in cages. But just these, look, the left often uninformed. Yeah. They have these bullet points that they feel like they definitely can shut a conversation down. That's with. what I mean. They, they don't in, feel like they inequality. have to learn yeah. a lot about a subject yeah. because you have these mic drop sayings or phrases that just stop people from talking. So instead of talking to people who disagree with them, they just put themselves in these echo chambers. And then when they are forced to talk to somebody that does have a response to their mic drop, they don't, their brains short circuit and they don't know what to do. And I think it's funny to watch. And case in point is a conversation that took place in there about transgender issues and somebody shared a video of Ben Shapiro talking about it and said that it was an interesting perspective and the person who posted this is a conservative in this group who likes to stir the pot so of course the swarm of liberals jumped all over this to tell him what a terrible person he is and oftentimes these political conversations are boring because you just have your right wing talking points versus your left wing wing talking points and everybody's just yeah, um, yeah, it's saying they're like dumb little catchphrases or memes or whatever their hot topic uh, talking point of the day is. But I think it's fun when you actually engage with the liberals on their level and then just use their own talking points against them. So you could approach this conversation like this guy here in this video, but if you approach them with that, they're just going to tell you that sometimes girls have penises, sometimes boys have vaginas, and then you're just going to say, uh, no, they don't, that's insane, and you're just going, you know, they'll come back with, oh, somebody's never, like, graduated from high school biology, or, oh, imagine going to high school 30 years ago and never looking into the subject again, like, there's all of a sudden newfound consensus that, um, you know, biological sex doesn't exist. But like I said, it's more fun to engage with them on their level. So I'm going to read you a little back and forth between me and uh, one of the gentlemen in this group. All names have been redacted. So again, it starts off with the Ben Shapiro guy posted and says, interesting perspective. And he comes back to say, I mean, not really. It's just another idiot who can't understand the role gender plays in society. I'm sure if you asked him what gender expression wigs, tights, high heels belong to, he'd say female. Just a few hundred years ago, he'd be wrong. So that means gender expression can change with the culture. And he's saying this as though people are now looking at pictures of George Washington, James Madison, whatever, with their powdered wigs and their tights and stuff, and thinking like, oh, that must be a woman because of the way they're dressed, which is ridiculous. So I left my own comment to try to stir the pot here on the post and said, I love it how people will say sex and gender are different and then turn around and say that if you like to wear tights or wigs, then that makes you a woman. I'm fairly certain people can understand the difference between a man and a woman, even though the cultural norms of how people dress have developed over time. And then my man responds to me and says, you think, but that doesn't seem to be the case. There's more to being a woman or a man than the plumbing you're born with. 
I'm born male, I identify as such. In order to signal to others that I do, it behooves me to use the gender expression of my culture, jeans or not shaving or the way I walk and sit. I have long hair. I've had it since I was 16. I got a lot of questions as to my gender when I was young. I said, so if a man shaves, that makes him a woman? I'm wearing jeans right now. Does that make me a man? Because you seem to be reinforcing these gender stereotypes more so than tearing them down. A man can dress however he wants and styles his, his hair however he wants, but he's still going to be a man. Just because someone doesn't fit into the stereotypes placed on them by society, that doesn't make them the opposite sex. But again, you conflate gender and sex when it helps your talking points, and then you want to differentiate between them when it better suits your argument. And in this video, Shapiro is clearly talking about the concept of biological sex and how it's observed in mammals, not gender expression. Well, this is one of the problems with this left-wing gender ideology is that no one who espouses it can even tell you what these words mean. It's like, what is a woman? They are conflating gender and sex because on one hand they say, well, you got your biological sex, but then your gender is whatever social construct. But then they turn around and say that trans women are women. So a man yeah. who, ha who, who identifies with, the, with the, the gender, the social construct of womanhood actually is a woman. So that's exactly my point. They want to tell you that these are two different things and explain to you the difference that sex and gender are now mean two different things. Even though when I grew up, I always understood them to be synonyms. I can understand that they are now making a distinction between the two, but they also want to conflate it and say that your gender then makes you a man or a woman. So my man comes back and says he's clearly talking about biological sex, which has nothing to do with being trans. There are no trans animals because animals don't have gender expression, thus no gender. Does a chicken have gender identity? Does a chicken cry? Well, a Does chi a chicken commit suicide? Let's frame it. So if biological sex has nothing to do with being trans, why do trans people want access to sex segregated spaces like bathrooms, sports, prisons, shelters? If transgender has nothing to do with biological sex and it's just about gender expression, then wouldn't the better course of action be that we accept that just because someone chooses to express themselves in a way that does not fit into the stereotypes put on them by society, that doesn't make them the opposite sex? Those are gender-separated bathrooms. Why is that better? Why does it matter? Just accept them for how they present themselves. And my favorite part here. Why are you so concerned about their bits matching how they look? I'm going to show you this other clip from this documentary, What is a Woman, where the transgender spokesperson on the Dr. Phil show, this person accuses Matt Walsh of just trying to reduce people down to their genitals, but that is actually exactly what they are doing. And Matt Walsh responds with basically like accusing this person of or equating being transgender to like doing blackface, like you're appropriating womanhood and making it a costume that you can put on. Womanhood is something that is an umbrella term. It includes people that who- That describes what? People who identify as a woman. What is that? Was to each their own. Okay. Each woman, each man, each person is going to have a different relation with their own gender identity and define it differently. That, so you want to reduce problem. women, you want to reduce men down to maybe just their genetics, our genitals, no. our chromosomes, right? That's what you're what saying. You want to do is that's what what, you, what you want to do is appropriate women. You want to appropriate womanhood okay. and turn it into basically a costume that could be worn. So how I would have responded to that if I were in Matt Walsh's position said, funny you should say that meaning f that I'm obsessed with making sure people's bits match. Funny you should say that because that's the exact opposite of what I said, but it is in fact the point that you're, you are making. I'm saying that the way someone chooses to outwardly express themselves doesn't need to match their bits. Men can wear heels or makeup or a dress and that's fine. It doesn't mean they're a woman because that's how they choose to express themselves. You seem to be saying that the characteristics X, Y, Z are for men, like not shaving, wearing jeans, and characteristics A, B, C belong to women, like the way they walk or the way someone sits. And I am certainly not advocating that people have surgeries to make their bits match whatever way they want to outwardly express themselves. Going back to the bathrooms, no, they are sex segregated. You can look up Supreme Court cases on the subject. They didn't create separate bathrooms for people who like to wear dresses versus people who wear jeans or people who have long hair versus short hair. 
The need for separate spaces was about biological sex. And my man comes back and says, look, like I said, I have long hair. That alone doesn't make me fit a gender role, either one. Neither do genes. It's a lot more complex than that. It's about how you approach the world, how you view the world, how you want the world to view you. It's your walk, your talk, your cadence, your inflection, your very words. It's about your gestures, your grooming, your styles. There's so much that makes us male or female in the eyes, in others' eyes that we just absorb as little children without even noticing. As for court cases, you mean like this one? And then he links to a recent Supreme Court case about like a transgender bathroom law when like, no, I was clearly talking about like the women's rights movement, uh, the need to create these sex segregated spaces in the first place, not what he's trying to change the subject to now. But you're the one that said that you wear jeans and that you don't shave so people know that you're a man, not me. I think people should be able to express themselves however they like, and we don't need to tell kids, or even adults really, that just because they have interests that are stereotypically assigned to the other sex, that doesn't mean we need to put them on hormones or have surgery to make their bits match. But again, it's hilarious that you think I'm the one obsessed with people making sure people's bits match, while you advocate for hormone therapy and surgery to ensure the very thing that you are accusing me of. Yes, I'm aware that you refuse to see the difference between sex and gender. Like, I haven't been clear on that distinction the entire conversation. So first, let's define the terms sex and gender. Yes, please. Sex is biology. Sex is unchanging. It's based on chromosomes. 99.999% of the cells in the body are marked either male or female. Gender, on the other hand, is a perception. It's a feeling. It's a way of identifying. It's, a, it's an experience. Okay, that's, that's subjective. We've got gender and sex, right? Yeah. What, what's the difference between the two? Is there a difference? I saw that in your questions and I thought, my goodness, this is what we spend an entire semester kind of thinking through. But what we tend to think about in the social sciences today is that sex refers to a set of biological characteristics and gender is a social construct or category. Sex is biological reality and gender are the stereotypes imposed on us by society due to our biological sex. It's really not that hard of a concept to grasp. My question is, why can't people just express themselves, themselves however they choose and not worry about the gender stereotypes imposed by society instead of taking hormones or having irreversible surgeries to make their bits match with society's stereotypes? And why does someone think that they should have access to sex-segregated spaces based on their gender since we just established that those are two entirely different things? But yes, you're right. I'm the one who doesn't understand what I'm talking about and is simply obsessed with making sure people's bits match their interests. See, you really don't understand gender. Here, the WHO put it into simple terms for you. As for why they can't just deal with it and not subject you to their issues, it's because that's about as effective as pretending you're not gay. It doesn't go away no matter how much they'd like it to. It's hard being trans. Nobody would just choose it on a whim. And then he shares a screenshot uh, where the WHO says exactly what I have been saying and what we showed you in that clip. That one is biological sex, one is social constructs. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. The social constructs, aka stereotypes, that are imposed on us by society. And I didn't say I didn't want to be subjected to their issues. I said we should advocate for people being able to express themselves however they like, regardless of how the societal constructs want us to act. Instead of putting people on hormones or going through surgery so their bits conform to these made-up societal constructs. I like scented candles. And yeah. I've watched Sex and the City. And yeah. How do I know if, if I'm a woman? You know, I... I That's a great I like, question. I, people who talk about the diversity in gender are actually talking about diversity in personality and temperament, but they don't know it. You can have a masculine temperament if you're a woman. Maybe one in ten women have the average temperament of a man. And you can have feminine men temperamentally. And it's not that uncommon because the differences between men and women temperamentally aren't that great. There are masculine girls. There are feminine boys. What are we going to do about that? Carve them up? 
My man comes back and says, why? It doesn't hurt them any more than breast enlargement does. Matter of fact, having their mental image match their physical body is proven to lower stress and prevent suicidal ideation. Now, Facebook would actually not let me post this, which is why the color is different, sort of grayed out. You can't, And it says pending down here. Facebook won't let you post this study from the NIH about the long-term effects of these gender or sex reassignment surgeries. I said, breast enlargements don't cause infertility. We're also not advocating for children to get breast enlargements. So that's a really dumb comparison. And I'd say the data on whether sex reassignment surgeries prevent suicide is inconclusive. Certainly not proven. I'm a biological woman that medically transitioned to appear like a male through synthetic hormones and surgery. I will never be a man. Is it transphobic for me to tell the truth why is it then a couple hundred years from now if you dug up my body they're gonna go yep that was a woman had babies can you tell me about the procedures that you you had i've had seven surgeries i've had one stress heart attack i've had a helicopter life ride uh with a pulmonary embolism i've had uh 17 rounds of antibiotics i had six inches of hair on the inside of my urethra for 17 months. Nobody would help me, including the doctor that did this to me because I lost my insurance. I get infections every three to four months. I'm probably not gonna live very long. Was there any real discussion of the risks and the side effects and? No, no, there's not. And I know that people wanna think that there is, but there's not. The truth is, is that medical transition is experimental. We have um, studies that said that medical transition helps mental health, helps mental health with kids. They've all been retracted, modified, changed. But the only long-term study tells us seven to 10 years is when transgender people are the most suicidal. After? After surgery. But that's transphobic to say. And then I put a link to a study that said that there was no evidence that these surgeries are providing um, or reducing the mental health issues. And he says, uh, I'm not advocating for hormone therapy and surgery. That's for their doctors to do. I advocate for acceptance of transgender people so they can be a comfortable part of society just as I am. Who is advocating sex reassignment operations on children? Nobody. Oh, here's a video where they are doing exactly that. The leading people in their fields are advocating for that, actually. What's the, what's the youngest patient that you've operated on? The youngest patient I've done vaginoplasty on um, is age 16. Do you worry that minors just don't understand enough about themselves? They're not neurologically developed enough yet to make permanent life-altering decisions? Absolutely not. A young person's self-perception, one day they may be clear, the next day they may be totally confused and not sure, and you're affirming it with hormones that have never been used in this way in the, in the field of medicine. You're talking about puberty blockers? Blockers and then opposite sex hormones. And at what age does the medical transition begin with uh, medication? So medical affirmation begins when the patient says they're ready for it. Puberty blockers, which are completely reversible and don't have permanent effects, are wonderful because we can put that pause on puberty. Just like if you were listening to music, you put the pause on and we stop the blockers and puberty would go right back to where it was. The next note in the song just delayed that period of time. How many studies do they have, long-term studies, on hormone blockers with children? None. I just spoke a month or two ago with a mother whose 14-year-old daughter was put on blockers. They discovered after two years, this 14-year-old girl has osteoporosis. That's something that, like, old women get. How can doctors assure parents that a certain medicine is totally safe? If based on what you're saying, they can't possibly know that. How can they be removing the healthy breasts of 15-year-old girls? How can they be sterilizing kids? Is Lupron chemical castration? Yes. 
we're giving it to pedophiles, aren't we? We're giving it to people that are dying. And we're giving it to kids telling them that they were born in the wrong body and it's completely safe. One of the drugs used is Lupron, right? Which mm -hmm. has actually been used to chemically castrate sex offenders. You know what? I'm not sure that we should continue with this interview because it seems like it's going in a particular direction. When you use that terminology, you were being malignant and harmful. I mean, there are some who would say that giving chemical castration drugs to kids is malignant and harmful. So now this next clip from What is a Woman shows you why there is um, hesitancy in academia to come out and speak out about what is going on here. And this is somebody in the industry who left because of this pressure that she felt to conform. I left academia because the climate had become too stifling politically, especially when it comes to the topic of gender identity and the science of gender. It is absolutely impossible to do good research. You basically have to decide beforehand what you're going to find so that you don't upset activists. And that is not how you do science. Why has this shift occurred where all of a sudden gender and sex have become so politically and uh, culturally charged. There's a really ugly history between sex researchers and transgender activists. In the past, if any sex researcher spoke out about science that went against activist orthodoxy or particular narratives that activists wanted to promote, they would basically have their personal and professional reputations ruined. So what you see is that only experts who toe the party line and say the things that activists like, those are the people who get attention, those are the people who get lifted up in the media. And also I would say people are incentivized to go along with the activist narratives and gender ideology because that helps their career. My man says the major scientific institutions don't agree with SEGM. It's not even recognized as a scientific group. I said, well, the authors of the study corrected their results, so it seems like they agree that the data doesn't support what they initially claimed. So regardless of whether he thought that that SEGM was a good source or not, the authors of the study did retract it. He says, that's one study. There are others. It doesn't change the consensus. It's about if the benefits outweigh the risks, and the consensus consensus is that it does and then he posts an article to slate magazine so you shit on and dismiss a study published on the nih website regarding a study sponsored by the swedish medical research center without having read it or looked at it because it might not be peer-reviewed so it's not scientific enough for you and then you run to slate.com like that's somehow a peer-reviewed scientifically accredited organization my man says the Slate article is about the issue as a whole, told from the perspective of someone who knows more about being trans than you or I. As though only a transgender person could have an opinion on this topic. Where does a guy get a right to say what a woman is? Women only know what women are. Are you a uh, cat? No. Can you tell me what a cat is? This is actually a genuine mistake. I am sorry I even came up there. I didn't read your study because I know I'm not qualified to really understand it unless I take it at face value. So he just flat out assumes that like I might get the wrong impression by what I'm taking at face value. So I'm not even going to read it. But I'd rather read what others who do have the basic understanding I don't have to say about it. Sure, perhaps the study was flawed, didn't have the proper control or whatever, but it's not like it's the only one out there. It's not a good basis to tell the entire medical community that they're wrong. So you admit that you have no data or evidence and you're dismissing a study without reading it because you have no reading comprehension skills of your own. As we already covered, you demand that the other side of the bait can only quote peer-reviewed scientific studies. But it's totally fine for you to cite Slate Magazine as your source because you don't understand scientific studies anyways. And there's multiple studies that range in findings from there's actually an increased likelihood of suicide after surgery which collected on data over which collected data over 30 years and is really the only long-term data conducted to there's no detriment or benefit to mental health post surgery but you claim that there's a lower risk of suicide after surgery and that there's just a plethora of consensus on this subject and I'm refusing to see it so do you actually know of a scientific study that supports that notion since there is allegedly a vast amount of these studies, do you have a link to, oh, I don't know, maybe like two of them to show that there's at least more than one entity agreeing in this? Or are you just going to keep demanding that other people read info from the scientifically accredited organizations while you sit around and read Slate Magazine? I'm going to follow the science. 
Yes, I'll leave the number crunching to those who spent years learning how to do it correctly. I'm not so narcissistic as to think I know more than the experts. They all say the benefits outweigh the risks. No, they don't all agree. I just mentioned several that don't agree. And you are ignoring those experts because you trust the writers at Slate Magazine to understand it and explain it better than you. You don't understand the word consensus, it seems. Means a general agreement, which there isn't since there are multiple publications and scientifically accredited organizations that do not agree. I think where we got lost in defining gender is that you seem to think it's wholly external. It is internal as well. When your body doesn't match your identity, it causes stress. Why not do what's possible to alleviate that stress? The reason people's feeling, internal feelings don't align with their external bodies is due to these stereotypes or societal constructs that are placed on us by society. That if you feel X, then those are woman feelings. Or if you enjoy Y, then those are man hobbies. And then people feel like they're in the opposite, they are the opposite sex because the way that they feel and express themselves doesn't align with societal impositions. My solution is to stop with the gender constructs and to let people express themselves outwardly however they like, so that way people don't feel the need to go on hormone therapy or have surgery to make their bits match to conform to these gender stereotypes. So where it appears we got lost is when you started accusing me of being obsessed with making sure people's bits match when I'm literally doing the opposite. I think people should be able to outwardly express themselves however they choose and there are no internal feelings or outward expressions that solely belong to one biological sex. So I'm saying that everyone should just be free to be themselves and I don't think we should be advocating for people to become slaves to big pharma for the rest of their lives just so their bits can match their feelings and outward expressions. Because if gender is a made-up societal construct, then by definition, being transgender is having surgery to alter your body so it fits in with made-up societal constructs. So your position appears to be that people should have surgeries and on hormones for the rest of their lives so that way their bits can conform to the feelings that are being imposed on them by society. For the first time in history, a marginalized group has a huge dollar sign on the top of their head. We have five children's hospitals in the United States promoting that. And what? That's a phalloplasty. That's a bottom surgery. We have five children's hospitals in the United States telling girls that they can be boys at $70,000 a pop in a surgery that has a 67% complication rate that will kill me from infection that I can't sue on we're butchering a generation of children because nobody's willing to talk about anything we're telling children when they haven't fully developed that all you have to do is medically transition and you fit in it got me at 42 your child doesn't have a chance every child that they convince is is transgender and in need of medical transition, it generates $1.3 million to pharma. So what's your solution? We can't disband society. I guess you'd rather sell them out to big psychiatry or something. According to the best knowledge they have, this is the best option for these people. If you don't trust them, that's on you. Doesn't mean that they're wrong. But if you do trust them, that's on you. That doesn't mean that they're right. And if you crack open a history book, you will see that corrupt people can not only work in the medical industry, they can, in fact, be well-respected well -respected leaders of it. And personally, I'd rather see someone being sold out to big psychiatry than to big pharma. I believe there's some medical doctrine about how you're supposed to start with the least intrusive treatments and then escalate as necessary. As discussed, cultural and society is capable of evolving, and it appears that we get more accepting and inclusive with each generation. So yeah, I'd rather see people seeking help through a psychiatrist who can help them manage their gender dysphoria and learn that it's okay to not fit in with stereotypical gender roles placed on society until society catches up to the fact that people's appearance, dress, mannerisms, cadence, interests, all the stuff that he already listed, do not determine if someone is a man or a woman. And that seems like the better option than pumping kids full of puberty blockers and hormones or undergoing surgery to make their bits match to these made-up standards by society. Not only does option A seem like the morally, ethically, and inclusive course of action, it also doesn't come with the health risks regarding infertility, high blood pressure, risk of stroke, and a lifelong dependency on criminal pharmaceutical companies. 
I understand that you think option B is better because you read in Slate Magazine that these procedures will decrease the short-term risk of suicide. I don't dispute that you have sources that state as much. But given that the only long-term study ever conducted shows that people are more likely to commit suicide post-transition, I gotta go with the science on this one. Because the data suggests that we are not preventing suicides with surgeries, we are just delaying them. So your solution, while I'm sure is well-intended, is very short-sighted and is ultimately not helping anyone in the long run. And by advocating for people to physically alter their bodies so their bits match, you are inadvertently reinforcing the stereotypes that have caused transgender people the confusion and an angst in the first place. But I'm sure it makes you feel like a good person for championing these causes that you clearly know nothing about, so it does appear that you have accomplished your goal. Albeit, a very selfish one. And that was the end of my discussion with Spongebob there. But I want to show this last clip from What is a Woman where Jordan Peterson talks about one of the other uh, bigger issues, the more macro issue going on here with this changing of language and redefining words. And why should we care if we live in a society where gender is Well, fluid? I cared because my government decided that I had to call people by the terms that they were, that they designated, or I'd be subject to legal penalties. It's like, no. I'm not doing that. I don't care what your reason is. You don't get control of my tongue. So the point is that doing these little things in the name of being nice and giving up these rights to free speech and letting people criminalize y your language, that's, again, that frog in boiling water analogy. It doesn't seem like a big deal. You're just being nice to people. You're just being inclusive. But you are inadvertently giving up your rights in the process. Every time this has happened through history, it has always been framed as this is for the greater good. And I've liked to quote the book 1984 on this channel before. And there are a couple quotes in there that I think 100% apply to this topic. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five. And you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it but the very existence of the external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. The heresy of heresies was common sense. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. And that led to this exchange between the two characters in the book, where the guy says, how can I help it? How can I help but see what is in front of my eyes? Two and two are four. Sometimes, Sometimes they are five. Sometimes they are three. Sometimes they are all of them at once. You must try harder. It is not easy to become sane. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. And the inverse of that is true too. If you don't have the freedom to say the obvious, if you do not have the freedom to say that two plus two makes four, if that is not granted, then nothing else follows. If you people cannot state what they can see with their own two eyes, and there is no common language to be able to speak about reality, and you don't have the freedom to do anything. And the last quote here that I just think summarizes a lot of what I see when I talk to liberals, this like cognitive dis dissonance, this very short-term memory that they have, just this quote perfectly applies to it here. It says, to know and not know, to be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully cr constructed lies, to hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in them both, to use logic against logic, to repudiate morality while laying claim to it, to believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy, to forget what it was necessary to forget and then draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again, unconscious of the act of hypnosis that you had just performed. To even understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. These people, they just have short-term memory loss where they can't remember that Hillary Clinton complained about losing this 2016 election and that Trump was illegitimate and the election was stolen from her and that's no big deal they just totally forget about that but then magically go along with this narrative that 
uh, Donald Trump doing the exact same thing is this threat to democracy and the worst thing that's happened since 9-11 and just all the other news stories that they forget of the time that the media lies to them and they just do not remember it. They just have how with Me Too that disqualifies Donald Trump from being president but then now we're not supposed to believe all women when it comes to the lady that accuses Joe Biden. This how you can have no principles that you are consistent about of your own and you just go along with whatever the news or the party tells you is very scary to witness in real time. And I never appreciated how scary and lonely it is to be one of the people that does not fall into this pattern of double think and blind loyalty and no critical thinking skills when it comes to a political party. And I hope you tune in for the next Genuine Questions where we do talk about a lot of that authoritarian um, policies that are now being put in place and what that is potentially going to mean for society. So thanks for watching and hope you tune in for the next one.